Amen. God is so good, and he is so good, he blessed us all to see another day of our lives, and especially to come together to be among the saints to worship him on this Lord's day. Good to see everybody this morning, and as I said before, it's, it's good to be here, and it's good to be here that the Lord has blessed us with our health and strength to see another day, but also to come together and to fellowship with our church members. And I'm losing my, my volume. Don't, don't turn me down, brother. <laughs> Keep me up so everybody can hear. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's go ahead and get started in our lesson. Now, last week we talked about boundaries. And I gave out a worksheet that would help those who would like to sit down with their spouse and go over boundaries. Because one thing about boundaries, it helps your relationship when the person knows your boundary and respects your boundaries, and it cuts down, and I'll use this term, friction in the marriage, or friction in the relationship. So even though I'm talking about marriage, it does not exclude single people, our single brothers and sisters, because as you are searching and looking, look at some of the characteristics or the behavior of the person you may be interested in. Because see, if you don't, have all the hearts in your eyes, you want to be able to see beyond that affection or that attraction. Because see, sometimes attraction can blind you for what you are really getting into that you really don't want. Amen? And, and the thing about it is one thing when you get into it <clears throat> and then you, you heard that saying, if I know now, what I should have known then, I wouldn't have made that mistake. But now that you're in it, now we got to do it God's way. So now we got to work with what we have to better the relationship. No relationship is beyond repair or salvage. But it takes two to make it work. But it takes one to stay focused in their relationship with God. Remember when I drew that triangle? If you want to have that relationship with God, you got to have that relationship going out or that love going out, regardless if it comes back to you. All right, let's, let's, let's go ahead and pull up our PowerPoint. Now, the handout that I gave last week, we talked about boundaries and marriage, and then we had a conclusion, but not exhaustive, <clears throat> because... 
This is a lesson that's not like you get to the end of it, it's done, you know everything. No, it's a continuation. Same way your Christian walk or your Christian life is a continuation. You don't get to the point where you say, okay, I'm done, I'm finished, and I can sit back and rest. No, you cannot. Even in your relationship, you cannot, <clears throat> excuse me, stop because it's a continuation. Like I, I had mentioned earlier, how many of you know everything about your spouse? Nobody. You are still learning each other, but it should get better and better. Amen. <clears throat> because the boundaries are needed in a marriage, especially when either spouse fails to owe up to their responsibilities in the home and marriage. And that's why I said, that's why I'm, I, you know, it seems like Brother Good's a little hard on the man. And that's so because God gave the man the highest responsibility and accountability. And he gave the woman a responsibility and accountability of being his helpmate. So you, we both have to owe up to our responsibility and accountability. But there are times one may not owe up to measure, but it's the other's responsibility to help bring them up, not tear them down, stomp on them, wipe their feet and say, adios amigo, I'm out of here. No, you have to work it because you took that vow. What was that vow that says for better or for worse? It's not always going to be better. There are going to be some worse times. Let's face reality. There's going to be some worse times. But it's getting through those worse times that will make you appreciate the better. And I gave an example Oop, PowerPoint. So I gave examples like if the husband refused to owe up to his responsibility as the head of the house, leaving decisions to the wife, and he wants the wife to wait on him, well, he's falling down on his responsibility. But it's the wife's responsibility to help move him back into position that God put him in. So that's one of the blessings that a wife, if she's a godly wife, a spiritual wife, to help him say, no, I am not going to be your mama. You're going to be the man. And she is her responsibility to help him achieve that goal or be in that, uh, have that status. And then example, the wife wants to dominate the rule of the house and not let the husband lead. Well, here, she done left her role or her responsibility because God didn't put the wife as the head of the house or the head of the household. That's the man's role. Brother Stewart, um, Brother Mary, bring your mic. So while he's bringing you a mic, that's what I was, my next question was, were there any questions of the handout that I gave last week about the boundary worksheet and marriage? Anybody have any questions concerning that? Well, if you don't, if you have an opportunity, just sit down and go over it with your spouse. And if you're single, just go over it to see some of the criteria or categories that you need to be familiar with if you're going to be in a relationship or you plan on getting married. Know your boundaries, and then that way you can sometimes, and this is where the dating process comes in, and we'll speak more on dating later on in our lesson, to let the person know, uh oh, somebody, the president calling? <laughs> to let them know your boundaries. And see, when you let the person that you're dating know your boundaries, it will cut off a lot of frustration or surprises down the road because one of the things that we find ourselves uh, doing is having high expectations. And when the expectations aren't met, then we get disappointed. Brother Stewart, um, what, what mic is that? Mic number one, can you turn it up? Hello. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Brother Good, one of the things that would help us uh, in uh, 
maintaining our, our relationship is understanding when we uh, uh, don't accept our responsibility and, it, and we go against what the wife or the husband said, we're not going against what the wife or husband necessarily said, we're going against what God has created. You're jumping ahead on God me, brother, says, but, but you got God it. God says man is the head. God says we both have certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So when one of the other lacked in that responsibility, you're lacking in what God tells us that we need mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think that would, excuse me, help us somewhat when we uh, refer to it as, you know, not doing what God says and not what my husband says. Right. You know, if this is what God says, then I am to do it. You right. As long as my husband follows God's rules, the same thing applies to my wife. You mm -hmm. know, so I think that helps us a lot. Well, you're getting into the lesson because we're going to, we're getting further into that. Sister Dooley, you have your hand up? Let's go ahead and we're going to move to the next slide. Uh, Sister Dewey. When I first married my husband, he got baptized into the Church of Christ. So I had to teach him his roles as husband. So I told him, you have to pray. So you have to do the things because I don't, I can't pray over you, you know, we, I can pray over you as you, you and I in the house and stuff, but I would prefer you to do it because you're the husband. You know, I would prefer you to do it. So I kind of let him walk into his role. And I told him, I said, I would address him as you're my king. So you're the, you're the, you're the head of the house. And mm -hmm. then he slowly started to take his role where we studied it and we started, I started showing him where it was in the Bible that he was the head of the house. And see, what you're doing, you're doing your help meet role. And see, sometimes wives help their husband to see and be where they should be. And that's the role or responsibility of the wife to make sure that her husband is following God's or doing God's will. And when God said the husband is the head and the wife is to be submissive, that is not optional. That's a commandment. That's mandatory. Let's go out now into our lesson. Problems in marriage, considering each other's needs. And see, when we are doing our role as the husband or the wife, Part of that role is to making sure that your spouse is having her or his needs fulfilled. And see, when there's not being met, then there's problems in the relationship. And see, one thing about our temperaments, we're going to meet our needs godly or ungodly. So that's one of the reasons that we have to have that communication with our spouse so that we can make sure our needs are being met. That's why I was saying with that boundary worksheet on each of those categories, take time and sit down with your spouse. Just go over it. And I know sometimes it's difficult for some relationships because one or the other don't like to talk. But if you want the relationship to, to grow and to flourish, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Let's look at considering a wife's need. And see, brothers, when we ask that wife, will you, that means that you are going, you are now saying, I'm going to be committed if you accept my proposal that I'm going to take care of you. So that means that you have to learn her needs. You don't know all this beforehand. And if you want to do it God's way, you don't learn this by test driving. If you understand what I'm saying. You learn this when you say, I do, and the preacher says, now I pronounce. Now it's the, it's the learning. Because 
women are more relationship oriented and men are more goal oriented. And in most counseling, it is found that men have a hard time expressing love to their wives and women have a difficult time showing respect to their husband. Now I can stay here for almost a whole week, but we're touching on this because we're gonna come back to it again later. In counseling, it is found that men have a hard time expressing love to their wives. You, you probably heard it said many a times, you know, women or the wives have difficulty at times when their husband don't express love to them because women want to be affirmed. They want affirmation. They want to hear, I love you. And then when you ask, when the spouse tells the husband, you know, you never say, I love, you love me. Well, I did 30 years ago, and if I change my mind, I'll tell you. That's not love. That's not affirmation that, that, our, that our marriage is solid. Because as, as we talked about before, men don't talk. And sometimes when they say something the first time, that's it. And if I change my mind, I'll say, I'll, I may say it, but then again, I may not. And then, we'll we touch more on this. Women have a difficult time showing respect to their husbands. Why? I'll tell you why. What do you say, Sister Rupert? <laughs> because sometimes men don't stand up to be men. And if you're not standing up to be a man, why should she respect you? Amen. That's why. And then sometimes there are, there are some women who come from a domineering environment. Their mother was domineering, grandmother, and guess what you be raised up to be? Domineering. And now you want to get in a relationship and marry a man, and usually a dominant woman will look for a more docile man, because she, she definitely want to control him. But she may fall in love with a man that's a man. And so now there's going to be problems of her trying to give him respect, but it can happen, okay? Because see, that's one thing that, that you heard over and over again. Women love what? Begins with R. Romance. Romance. And men want another R. Respect. And see, that's what's happening in a marriage. And, and we'll go over this. You know, brothers, learn how to romance your wife. And one counselor concludes that men are fulfilled through working out the details of a problem and women are fulfilled talking about the problem. And, and I'll speak for myself. If there's a problem, I just want to solve it. I like solving problems. But the wife don't want it solved. I want to talk about it. And I'm standing there and saying, well, here, will you be quiet and let me talk? That's basically what she's saying. Be quiet and let me talk. Because women are fulfilled through talking about a problem. Men are fulfilled by working out the details of the problem and solving it. And see, these are considering the wife's needs. Sister Stewart, uh, where's, where's my mic? Well, I mean, hold it, Sister Stewart. He, he coming. Brother, why, why do you think um, uh, that the Lord made this this way? That a man, for example, doesn't like to talk as much and a woman wants to talk about the problem as opposed to its being resolved or solved. 
Why do you think that that our temperament? Okay. Well, I will probably relate that to. Uh, I, I cut you off. That men relate because men are, and I'm, I'm going to say it, not all men are like this. You know, just some men. And some men like to talk where the women want to solve it. So it can be reversed. But in most cases, most men are like this because that's the nature of the man. I want to be protective. I want to make sure that everything is okay with you. So I really don't want to talk about it. If something's wrong, oh, let me fix it. I, I got it. But she is more so, she wants affirmation. She wants to say, wait a minute, I want to talk. You know, I've, I've, um, I had okay. one, one, one counseling class where that was the issue of the whole problem in the relationship. She wanted to talk. And she said, and he, she would get upset when he's ready to get a solution and before they can even come to an agreement, now they're in an argument. And so now you go to your room and I go to my room. But that's the nature of man. Because that's why God said that in, in uh, 1 Peter 3, that the man has to treat her as a weaker vessel, not uh, uh, to the point that he's better than her, but that's the that's a woman's makeup, woman's chemistry. That's why women can bear more pain than a man. And if you don't believe me, I'm glad I'm not a woman, but I don't think I can bear child giving childbirth. And I was in the delivery room with my wife, and I want to scream myself. I said, "Let me out of here." Oh yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Stewart. I asked myself the same question. Why is it that God made one to want to talk and the other one to want to solve or just the opposite? And after going round and round and round and round for, I don't know, probably years, I settled on, God knew that if we clicked, we would think we could live without him. Mm -hmm. And so now, we, he set us up almost so that the relationship drives us to our knees and we need him to get through the relationship. And, and you're absolutely right. So we not only need him, but he made it so that we need each other. Sister Lee, you're going to have to take your mask because it's going to sound muffled. Um, I'm not going to say I fall under any category, but how can you solve any problem without a discussion? How can you how solve what? That. How is any problem solved without a discussion? Any session? Any problem. How is any problem solved without a discussion? You can't solve a problem without a discussion. Because, see, some temperaments are, you should know how I feel. No, I don't know how you feel. I can't read your mind. So it does take discussion. That's why. Remember what the number one problem that we talked about early in our class? What's the number one problem? Communication. No problem can be resolved without a discussion or communicating. You know, uh, a, a brother or sister might walk past you and don't speak to you. Well, you're not going to assume, well, they got this, that, and other. You want to know what, what's the problem. And then if they tell you, now you know. That's that discussion. That's that communication. Sister Coates. Brother Good, now, if you had two talkative people, you, you wouldn't get a lot done. I, I can give this to the male. They, they are good listeners. Somebody has to listen. And mm -hmm. I, do, I do find that they are good listeners. Well, I'm gonna you, you're right. Somebody has to listen while, and two people can't talk, but I have seen two people talk. And not a lot gets done because they find themselves trying to talk over each other. 
Brother Good, I, um, and Brother Rupert, it's nothing like this before I say this, but I do believe that so many men are, they watched how their father and mother uh, worked and how the, the mother could not talk to the father because the father would be ready to hit her. Mm -hmm. And I uh, attribute a lot of it to the way they were reared. They, and I have heard this said that something about, because I can't, something about the women or to, something about the men. Anyway, it all sums up to you supposed to be quiet and, and I'm supposed to take care of things. That's what the, the men say. But I don't know how it go because I can't, I don't know how that rhymes, but it's something that, do you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? I know what you're saying. What I'm talking about. Women should be heard. I mean, women should be seen and not heard. That's it. That's right. it. And I believe that a lot of them uh, was taught that, and then they watched the behavior. So a lot of women are so afraid to talk to their husbands because of the repercussions. Mm -hmm. And see, you, you, you went ahead of the lesson, but I'm glad you said that. A lot of your learned behavior is from the home. What, what are the three E's we talked about? Your example, your environment, and your experience. A lot of men learn how to treat their wives basically by their husband. That's not always the same because I'm just be honest, in my home, my father wasn't, wasn't the type of husband to my mother that he should be. But children learn start from the home. Now, uh, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, when you're at the table eating, dinner, how many of you have a family conversation while you're eating at the table? I said you don't have to raise your hand, but she's going to raise her hand anyway, I know. <laughs> and how many of you had family dinner, and the only thing you heard was the knives, the forks, and the, and the clanging and, and mouth chewing? That's the environment I came from. There was no talking at the table. And if you did talk at the table, you probably got smacked upside the head because that was the rule in that home. Where in some homes, that's the time that the family gets together to have a discussion, family discussion, while eating. And it took me a long time to get used to that because my, when it came to eating, eat your food, be quiet, and get up and you're done. Then I develop, I like to read comic books as I eat. <laughs> but then, setting the stage for love. One of the main difference between men and women is the way each looks at love and at what, and what each consider a lover to be. Yes, sir. You know, I always thought that when we um, come to the table to eat, I thought you had to be quiet so you wouldn't choke over your food or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a myth. But coming from my grandparents and my grandparents' home and my home on both sides of the family, there was no talking while we were eating. Now, you talked afterwards, but not during dinner. And yes, that was a myth. You might choke while you're talking and eating at the same time. But here, consider what a lover to be. And that's where that communication comes in. Because some women like to be romance a certain way, where the husband might like to be romance a certain way. And if you don't talk about it, and there's nothing wrong about talking about it, because see, sometimes we feel shy. How many of us feel shy around our own spouse? Yes. Sometimes we feel shy around our spouse because, you know, I don't want them to think I'm, you know, I'm weird or something like that, but you're married. You know, that's the thing about marriage. You know, now you can take your clothes off. You don't have to hide and so, oh, you know, like you got company in the house. 
But that's how it gets to the point where you're not having that communication with each other. Let's look at the husband's associate erotic love with such behaviors as being aggressive, gallant, viral, or masculine. And see, that's the way men think. Men think he has to be, ah, oh, come here, babe. You know, that's not the case. Women don't like to be treated or grabbed, so to speak. Let me use this term. I'm, I'm, I, I know we got probably children watching this, so I got to be careful with, my, with what I, how I explain this. Men are more aggressive physically where women want tenderness and touch. And, and the word that they use, uh, that they say, women like foreplay. Men like wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, I'm done. All right, well, good. Now let's, let's keep our words right now. <laughs> but, that's the, but that's how the relationship is if it's not communicated, talked about. I want romance. Let's slow down. Let's go to dinner. Let's go to the movie. So here, brothers, consider your wife's needs. You single men, consider what you're going to have to sacrifice to meet her needs to keep her happy. You know, you heard that saying, uh, a happy home is what? A happy wife. Come on, wives. A happy home is a happy wife. Let's, let's, let's look at another one. Continuation of wife's needs. Wives, on the other hand, equate lovemaking with such behavior, behaviors as being charming, romantic, desirable, intimate, and involved in touching. Women slow it down. They like the touch. They like romantic words. Y'all look at me funny. <laughs> they desire, they're desirable. And see, that's why sometimes when a, when a man comes home, his wife looks different. And why does she look different? Because she wants to be romanced by her husband. So she might have on perfume or a special dress or, or food, uh, his favorite food cooked and so forth. That's a woman. She wants to equate lovemaking with behaviors as being charming, romantic, desirable, intimate, and involved in touching. And brothers and husbands, you don't know this overnight. This is talking, and I use this other word, sometimes you got to experiment. You know, I touch her this way and she pulls back. Oh, that don't work. You know, you come home with a box of chocolate. That don't work. But you come home with a bag of avocados. Oh, thank you. Experiment. The husband tends to look at lovemaking in a mechanical and reasonable way where the wife looks more deeply into the feelings and tenderness of the expression of love. That's what I said earlier. Women like to be touched. They like to be cooled, talked to softly. Where the man comes in, he says, okay, let's go. She doesn't like that. Now, she may tolerate it because of her responsibility, a, a role as a wife. But husbands have to learn how to, and I'll use this term, how to turn your wife on. Wives, you got to learn how to turn your husband on. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's experiment. It's talking. Do I see a hand back there? Sister Okima, is that you? 
Wait a minute. Let, let me get you. Good morning. Um, I to say. How it seems so black and white, um, the husband mechanical and, the, you know, when sometimes it's the other way around. Okay, thank you. It, it, and she's right. Sometimes it's the other way around. And we'll, we'll get to more of that as, as we talk, because, see, it's not always the, the wife that wants romance. Sometimes it's the husband. But sometimes the wife would say, come on, let's hurry up, let's get over, I got something to do. She's the one that's mechanical. And for a man to get to know his wife as a lover, he must enter her world of love, look, of, of the world of love, looking through her eyes and feel her romantic love. Husband, we got to slow down. You know, you, you can't be setting the clock, saying, oh, I got 15 minutes. <laughs> no, sir. You have to look at love through her eyes. And then when you do that, not only do you satisfy her needs, but yours also, but now you're finding yourself getting closer together which means that now she feels when you are not home at a certain time. You know, it's, it's just like uh, he's working late, she can't go to sleep till he gets home. That's that closeness. Or the man, he's at home, he said, well, I can't eat till she gets home. And what a man values, he takes good care of. If the husband values his wife, he's going to take good care of her. And that can apply to anything. Whatever you value, you're going to take good care of it. Amen. Some of them got that car. That car never sees dirt at all because he values that car and he takes good care of that car. But here we're talking about relationship. We need to value each other. And if we do, we'll take good care of each other. So, we talked about the wife, the wife's needs. Let's move on. Whoop. My PowerPoint went out. Okay, let's consider a man's need. The wife is to be dependent upon her husband. He is to be dependent upon her dependency. You know, husbands feel when his wife, he knows his wife want, needs him. You know, he gets, sticks his chest out. He's proud. If this is so, she feels feminine, protected, and cared for. He feels masculine, needed, and important. Amen. And the sister, amen with my brother, amen. amen. He feels masculine and important because of the dependency she has to him. At this time, you can make yourself prepared for Sunday school. The brothers can go ahead and go forward. And the wife's responsibility to her husband, submission. Wifely submission is a spiritual matter. It is to be done as unto the Lord Ephesians 5, 22. Brother McKinley, can we read that, that passage? Ephesians 5, 22. Wife's responsibility to her husband is submission. If you want to put it in one word, what's a wife's responsibility to her husband? One word, submission. And the wifely submission is a spiritual matter. And it's a spiritual matter because as she is submissive to him, as she is submissive to who? To God. That's the spiritual matter of it. <clears throat> Brother McKinley. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. 
Submission to the husband is a test of her love for God as well as a test of love for her husband. Now, why is I want to say this? Now, don't crucify me, because if you do, crucify Brother Rupert. <laughs> you cannot be submissive to, the, to God and not be submissive to your husband. That's called being a what? Hypocrite. That's the spiritual matter of it. If you submissive to God, you'll be submissive to your husband. Amen. Okay, I better move on because I'm coming back around to this. Sister Dooley. Women find it so hard to be submissive because they look at submissive the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Submissive doesn't mean that you have to, yes sir, no sir, can I do this, can I do that, and be a prisoner to your husband. Submissive, like, I consider myself very submissive to my husband, and I love it because I feel like I'm doing, I'm submissive to God at the same time. That it's, it's an honor for me to be submissive to my husband. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you for that because we're going to explain more on submissiveness. That's, that's a word I done made up. But anyway, as you're saying, submission does not mean you're a slave or servant. <clears throat> that's not what submission is. And that's the myth that has put on women today where they have it a hard time being submissive to their spouse because they said, I got to be yes, sir, no, sir, to you all the time. But that's not what it is. Uh, Brother McKinley, let's go to um, uh, 1 Peter 3. And let's, I think it's, let's, let's start with verses 1 through 6. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. What's, what's subjection? Now, what's another word for subjection? Submissive. Go ahead. That if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, be won by the conversation of, their, of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating, plaiting of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel, mm -hmm. but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Which is what being submissive to her husband is what in the sight of God? A great price. A great price. You see the spiritualness of that? Being submissive to your husband is a great price in the sight of God. Continue. Down to verse for, 6, I believe. For after this manner in old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Amen. You see, she was submissive, and, we, and, the, and the women are daughters of Sarah by being submissive to their husband, which is a great price in the sight of God. Now, don't crucify me on this neither. You cannot be a godly woman and disrespectful to your husband. Amen. I haven't got there yet. <laughs> I'm getting there, Sister Rupert. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> Sister Stewart. Um, another situation I think that exists, at least in this culture, is 
women do too many things for a man that is not her husband. Mm. And during the dating process, mm -hmm. for example, and and um, so and and in the dating process, you know, the things may not go well. You break up and you uh, date someone else, and things don't go well, and you and you are doing a variety of things beyond the dating relationship. Okay, such things as a man and a woman going buying a house together, and they're not married. Was, For example, right. I'm talking and, about heavy things. Okay? Right, and see, Sister Stewart, you're going into an area that we're going to cover okay. later down the road okay. as far as dating because, see, sisters, listen to me. You're not submissive to your boyfriend. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to get to, you know, what I'm, what I'm saying. Your, your submissiveness is going to be worn out mm -hmm. by the time you get to a husband. <laughs> okay, so we need to really clarify that during dating. Right, and see, that, that's a good point, and that comes to dating, but right now we're in the marriage right now, and that's why it's important that when we do get to the dating part, brother and sister, be aware of what you're looking for, and also be aware of what you may get if you don't see the sign. If you don't see the signs, don't think, I'll change them when we get married. That does not work. Who can change that person? Only God, if they're willing to let the spirit work. Good point, Rashida. Submission to the husband is a test of her love for God as well as a test of love for her husband. Let's continue with this. Now let's go to the man, Sister Rupert. Now we're going to look at consider a man's needs. Whoa, 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 slow down. The wife, understanding her role, and responsibility to her husband. That's what the man needs from his wife, to understand her role and her responsibility to him. Being submissive does not mean she becomes a slave. That's what Sister Dooley had just mentioned. Being submissive does not mean you are a slave. But it is a test of her love for God as well as a test of love for her husband. We just talked about that. A man needs respect from his wife. A woman wants romance. A man wants respect. And sister, he may not be what he should be, and don't crucify me again, because you had enabled him. You have enabled him to the point where you no longer respect him. Well, see, you didn't catch that while you were dating. <laughs> you did not catch that while you were dating. But now that you got him, he's worn, he's torn, he's yawned. <laughs> now you got to work with it. Now you got to work with him. The man, he needs three loving attitudes from his wife. Brothers, there's three loving attitudes we need from our wives. Warmth, empathy, and sincerity. We just looked over 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. 
To be warm is to have a friendly acceptance of a person and willing to share his concern. See, sometimes when a man gets beat up on the job at work outside the home, he comes home and he needs some warmth from his wife. I mean, husbands, how many of us have come home, we were so beat up, worn out, we can find, we just dragging ourselves through the, to the door. But there she is, ready to give you those three things. Empathy, understand and identify with his feeling. Know what he's going through. I mean, some of us work some hard jobs. I worked in construction, that beat me up. I worked in public relations, being on the force, that beat me up. But when I come home, she shows warmth and empathy. And now that helps bring me down. And then sincerity, showing a genuine concern for him without changing your attitude towards him when circumstances changes. Where everything is good and happy and bills paid and, and all that, you're this way. But what happens when he comes home and he says, you know, I just got laid off, or I'm fired. Then your attitude changes. What did you do? You good for nothing? Well, you didn't show him that warmth, empathy, and sincerity. But that's what he needs. Well, we got a few more minutes. And, and, and affirming words. This is what a man needs. Affirming words. Quality time. Giving and receiving gifts. Acts of service. And physical touch. And see, this goes both ways, too, for the women, too. She wants some gifts. She wants touch. She wants acts of service. She wants affirming words. And see, affirming words come from a woman can help boost a man, and I use this term, his ego. Give him his strength. Because my wife said, I can do it, I'm going to do it. Okay? And also giving gifts. You know, how many, you know, give your wife little gifts? You know, my wife brings me carrot cakes when she goes to the market. That's a nice gift to me. Yeah, it is sweet. Those carrot cakes are sweet. <laughs> and then there's the physical touch. Holding hands or just touching their head or something. That's affirmation. That's warm. Okay, look, our time is up. Let, let, me, let me do this. Lord's will next week. No, the week after next, because next week we have the uh, relationship seminar. Brother Moten's going to be teaching Sunday school class. But the week after that, we want to pick up learning and understanding each other's temperament. And we'll start with this. Whoop, 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 slow down. We're, we're going to start with the sanguine spouse in the marriage. So we're going to go through the, the, the temperaments in the marriage and learning and understanding your spouse's temperament. And if you don't know the temperament, maybe for some of the uh, slides that we show may give you an indication, oh, that, that sounds like my spouse. Class, you're being good. Lord's will, we'll pick it up the week after next. Great job. And we <laughs> so at this time, let us go to God in prayer. We're going to close out Sunday school, or you want to do it after you do that? Okay. Hold on one second, my brother. Let me pass the, the microphone to you. Sure enough, sure enough. All right, we'll do that right quick. Amen. Oh, give brother good one more time. Round of encouragement, please. Amen. Amen. What a good part, as he said. Next week, Brother Moulton will be with us, and he'll be sharing, teaching our Sunday school class, as you know, talking about marriage, because that is our relationship seminar theme. And so he will teach 
And then preach the word of God at 1030. Look forward to seeing everyone at 3 p.m. as we're going to have a fellowship meal at 1. And then we'll go into that part and look to come back one more time. All right, Sister Blue, I'm going to ask you to come forward, please, right quick. Bring the things on up to us. Now, as you know, we all, we honored our senior, our seniors during our senior gathering. And we had 72 seniors. Now, there are more here. Give a round of applause, please, because we encourage about our seniors. There was 82 on the list, and I'm sure there are more. And they play a major role in the church, as the Bible teaches and talks about that. First Timothy chapter 5, what we ought to do to encourage and all of the good thing. But in the midst of, we did not give out our gifts during that time. And so what we want to do this morning, we want to recognize those that were part of, or I shouldn't say those, but to give out the gifts right quick. And then we're going to close our time out and get ready for worship. So what I'm going to ask, some of our young people, yeah, uh, we have Sister, yeah, Sister Jasmine's daughter, what's, Jalen, yes, Jalen, Jalen, come on up, Jalen, right quick. And then do we have some more of our young people? Oh, she's in class? Well, you can, then you can come on up. I ain't got all the time. Jason back there? Is he back there? Well, come on up too right quick. Come on up, come on up. Stand on the side for me right quick. Judah's there too? Oh, look at Judah coming on up. She's just growing up. Do you believe she's a what? What are you, Judah? You'll be a senior? How many of y'all remember she was down here? And all of a sudden she just sprouted up. And it's good to have. Do we have any more? Any more right quick? Oh, come on, James. James, come on over here. Come on over here. Get on that end right there. You're a young man. Hold right there. Do we have one more? Jalen, come on up here. Come on up here right quick. Come on, please. And who is that young man walking and coming around on the side? Dylan. That's Dylan. Come on, Dylan, up here right quick. Is that Derek? Well, y'all help me then. I'm trying to see. Come on. They told me to put some steps in my steps. All right. So then you can go ahead, mama. Take your seat. Hey, man. Come, 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 come on up here. Right there, right there. Hey, man. Now we got four. What are we going to do right quick? I'm going to ask that you begin with you, Jay. Put your hand in there and pull out one of those. Stir it up right quick for me. And then pull one out. And then we're going to read the name. Of that person. Amen. I'm winning for today. There ain't no name on here. Well, yes, it is. Brother Harvin. He's sick. Sister Harvin here. That's what you get when you ain't here. You know that, right? Well, it's going to be Sister Harvin. We're going to put this in. All right. Sister Blue. So we're going to give that to you. You got that? All right. That's Brother Harvin. Come on over here, sir. All right. Now your name again? Eric. Eric. Come on, Eric. Stir it up. Reach way down in there and stir it up real good and give us the name. All right. Then we have here is Doris Brown. That's the winner. Who is Doris Brown? <laughs> All right, I'm just asking. Uh, uh, Doris Brown is the person. You know that, right? All right, we got Doris Brown to get one more. Come on, Jacob. Stir it up for us right quick and reach way down. And don't drop it in there again. Okay, I got that one. That's it. Sheila Coleman. Stella Coleman. Woo! She is here. Let's give her a round. Sister Stella, back there. Amen. Do this for me. Would you give that to Sister Stella? I'm going to give that to you. 
Okay, would you give that to Sister Stella? Okay, Judah, we got one more, please. If you don't mind to stir it up good for us, thank you so kindly. <laughs> well, you want to help me? Daniel Stewart. Daniel Stewart. Hey! You can't do nothing about it. That's right. Get at the brother Stewart if you don't mind for us, please. Oh, you need to get that from? Oh, bless your soul. Give that to him. All right. Well, that ends for this time. We want to thank all of our seniors. Thank God for you. What you do, supporting, giving, and the encouragement that we have from you. So let's pray together right now. Let's prepare to worship the Lord, get all things done so that we can. Amen. Won't you already remember our goal is... 2 Timothy, and this 1 Timothy, is always the spirit of encouragement. Amen. Amen. Let me repeat that again. When the church comes together, what is its purpose? It's to praise God. But in the spirit of what? Of encouragement. Let's keep that before us. So that all that we do, because children are watching, others are watching, and since they are watching, we need to always behave in the sight of the Lord. Amen. Amen. If we do it at home, we learn to practice here. Amen. Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you for the day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our teaching, what they are teaching. May we model him who set the example. Pray for our young people who have blessed us today. And then we'll thank you for our seniors who have given and paid a pay a path for us and to follow after the way of the Lord. We ask that you'll go with us and bless us. May you continue to be with us in the name, in the name of Jesus. Let us all together say amen. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in your life. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in my life. The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference, not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. Central, come on, come on, stop on, stop on by. We want 